Chapter 37 begins the last great section of the book of Genesis. Chapter 37 through chapter 50 is mainly about one of Jacob's sons. His ne the, next, the, the first son of Rachel, the older brother of Benjamin, this great, great man called Joseph. Uh, we're going to take much more time with Joseph. We're going to take much more time in talking about spiritual lessons and practical lessons in this part of the book of Genesis. It's amazing that so much of Genesis is devoted to the life of Joseph. Except for chapter 38, the rest of Genesis is basically the story of Joseph. And in chapter 37, where the story begins, we find Jacob living in Canaan with his children and now Joseph is 17 years old. And um, verse 3 says that Israel or Jacob loved Joseph more than all of his sons. Now, we talked about the problems with polygamy, the problems with more than one wife. One problem is that the difficulty is not just in the first generation. How are you going to have two wives? How are you going to have ten wives? How are they going to get along? How are you going to love each wife equally? Of course, Jacob didn't. And not only did he not love his wives equally, he did not love his children equally. Now, at least one, two of you have children. Maybe three or four of you have children. I don't know. I think maybe this, this varies from parent to parent. I think I can say with all honesty that I love my children equally. But I know parents who don't. Sometimes you just can't help it. And Jacob could not help loving Joseph more than the others, but he could have helped showing it. He could have kept himself from showing his great favoritism for Joseph, but he didn't. He gave Joseph a special coat that he didn't give to the others. So the brothers of Joseph not only knew that their father loved Joseph more, but they had to be reminded of it every time they saw what Joseph was wearing. And you have to understand that you, know, you go to your closet, I go to my closet, and we ask ourselves the question, what are we going to wear today? And the reality is in those days, probably you only wore one thing, and you wore it every day. And so every day, Joseph's brothers had this reminder that Jacob loved Joseph more than he loved them. They were reminded, they were reminded of it uh, by the clothes that he wore. Uh, and that made it even harder for them to like him. So we have two things. Joseph's father loved him more than the other brothers, but Joseph's brothers hated him more than the other brothers. They hated him so much that they couldn't help but show it. When they spoke to him, it was obvious that they hated him. That's what it says in verse 4. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, and so they hated him and could not speak to him on friendly terms. Now something happens to make matters worse, and it's a big, big theme in Joseph's life. It says in verse 5 that Joseph had a dream, and when he, t when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Uh, here was the dream. There were sheaves of wheat in a field, and Joseph's sheaf stood up over the sheaves of his brothers. And so his brothers say to him, are you actually going to rule over us? Is this what you're saying? Verse 9 says that he had another dream. And uh, he said that the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to him. And evidently the sun, the sun and the moon were Leah, the mother, and 
Jacob the father, and the stars were the brothers, and they were all bowing down to uh, the ground. And Jacob was upset by this. Jacob loved Joseph, but he was upset that Joseph shared this dream. Now, and of course his brothers hated him even more. Now we've got to stop a minute and then think about this. You have to understand that in the story of Joseph, there are many Bible teachers who talk about the mistakes that Joseph made, who talk about the things that Joseph did wrong, the things that he did that he should not have done. And I want you to know that those Bible teachers are godly and they are scholarly. They write books. I'm not a scholar. I've never written a book. But I have to tell you this. I think they're wrong. I don't think Joseph made any mistakes. At least I don't think he made any mistakes which Moses has reported to us. I don't think Joseph did anything wrong. And I'm going to tell you why. The complaint is this. Why did Joseph say something to his brothers which would seem so prideful and which would make them so angry and which would provoke them even more? That was stupid. Why didn't he keep quiet? Why did he boast about the content of those dreams? Well, I would answer that question in this way. Joseph didn't originate the dreams. The dreams were from God. The dreams were not from Joseph. The dreams were from God. And we have to ask ourselves a question. How did God publicize His Word? How did God give His Word? Here's a Russian Bible. They didn't have a Russian Bible. Here's an English Bible. They didn't have an English Bible. Here's a Greek New Testament. They didn't have a Greek New Testament. They didn't have a Hebrew Bible. They didn't have any Bible. Joseph had these dreams in a, in a century when the Word of God was not written down. In the generation that Joseph lived in, God made His Word known, God made His truth known, God made His will known, and God made the future known in other ways besides the written Word bound up within the pages of a book. And one way He made His Word known was by sending dreams. Now, let's think a moment about the Christian Gospel. Christian Gospel says that we're all sinners, that we're all lost, that we all deserve the wrath of God, and that we're all going to experience the wrath of God. The Christian Gospel says that we have shelter from the wrath of God by believing that Jesus of Nazareth, God's only Son, took the penalty for our sin took the punishment from a righteous and offended father on the cross in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. And that by that act of sacrifice, if we put our faith and trust in what Jesus did on the cross, we do not have to abide under God's wrath and punishment. As a matter of fact, because Jesus took our guilt and punishment, we by faith receive His reward, all the reward due to a man who lived a perfect life, all the reward due to the Son of God come in the flesh who always pleased His Father perfectly in every way. That's the Gospel. So what are we saying to the people who don't believe the Gospel? We're saying that they will abide under the wrath of God. We will know the love of God in a way that they will never know. And they will know the wrath of God in a way that we will never know. Now, don't you think that's just as offensive as the dream that Joseph told his brothers? Don't you think that that would upset them just as much or more 
then the brothers were upset. But it's the Word of God. We didn't originate it. We didn't say, I'm such a favorite of God, He's going to reward me, but He's going to punish you. That's not what it means. Maybe that's what they hear, but that's not what we're saying, and that's not what the Gospel is saying. But you see, the Word of God is offensive. The Word of God does make people jealous. And the fact is, Joseph was going to rule over his brothers. And that was the plan of God. So, for Joseph not to share that would not have been humility. It would not have been graciousness toward his brothers. It would have been disobedience. And it would be suppressing and hiding and covering up what God was saying to that generation. For you and I to refuse to share the gospel because maybe it seems prideful that we would think that we're going to heaven or because we know it's going to upset the people who are not going to heaven, that's not good manners. That's disobedience. And that's, that's putting our light under a bushel and refusing to let our light shine. And that's a refusal to tell the good news of the gospel out to the world. We don't have any rights over other people. They can trust Christ too. Christ is just as accessible to them as He is to us. And we're to share this good news with the world. We're going to see it again in the story of Joseph, where Joseph does something that makes some Bible teachers think he should not have done that. That was wrong. But this is the first place we see it. And what I insist is that he wasn't wrong. He was right. He was being faithful. I'm sure it embarrassed him. I'm sure he would have preferred that God had sent that dream to Judah and that Judah would have to tell everybody that Joseph was going to raise, reign over them. But he didn't send the dream to Judah. He sent the dream to Joseph. And so the man who was going to benefit from God's plan was the man who had the hard assignment to announce God's plan. So much so that it even offended his father who loved him. Of course it offended his, his brothers who hated him, but it even offended um, his brothers. Um, it says in verse 11, Genesis 37 verse 11, that his brothers were jealous of him. But it also said that even though his father rebuked him, that his, bro that his father never forgot it. His, his father knew God well enough and his father knew Joseph well enough to suspect that maybe it's true. Maybe the dream is not an idle fantasy that Joseph is having. But maybe the dream is really true. And maybe it is a, a message from God. The brothers went out to pastor their father's flock in Shechem. This is the area where all the... Um, members of the family of the young man had been killed in chapter 34. And, is, and, and Jacob sent Joseph to go check on his brothers um, to make sure they were okay. Now I want you to notice verses 12 and 13. Joseph is sent to check on the well-being of the people who hated him. His father wanted him to go and make sure that the men who hated him were safe. His father wanted him to risk his life in traveling alone through strange country to go to a country where the people would remember that those brothers killed people in the neighborhood to go to that country and make sure that the people who hated him were safe. And he agrees to go. Why? Because it was the will of the Father. Those ten aid workers who were killed in Afghanistan on August 12th, what were they doing? Well, some of them were eye doctors. One of them was an eye doctor, one of them was a surgeon, and one of them was a dentist. 
They were making sure that the people were okay. And while they were making sure the people were okay, the people who hated them killed them. Why did they do it? Not all of them, not all of them were Christians, by the way, but most of them were Christians. They did it because it was the will of the Father. The same reason Joseph went to check on his brothers. And the first place he goes, he doesn't find them. Now, it would have been acceptable, I think, to go back home and to say, they weren't there. I went to the place where you told me and uh, they weren't there. But he discovers that they're in a place called Dothan. And so he journeys on. He looks for them. And he looks for them until he finds them. It says in verse 17, Joseph went after his brothers and he found them. Why had he come? He came on an errand for his father. He came to bring them a message from his father. He came to see about their welfare. He came to make sure they were all right. So what did they do? They decided to kill him. Now, after Levi and Simeon killed the men of Shechem, Jacob makes efforts to be sure that his family uh, learns to know the one true God better. That's actually what we see in chapter 35. But you know what? It didn't work. It didn't work. Because in chapter 34, two of the brothers killed a young man in somebody else's family. But in chapter 37, more than two of the brothers decide to kill a young man in their own family. So you see, it's not working. Godliness is not something that happens from the outside in. You can't become godly, you can't become like Christ by submitting to religious ritual, by bringing sacrifices to altars or by conforming to the outward requirements of religion. Godliness, Christ-likeness, is something that can only happen from the inside out. It's something that God has to do on the inside of us. And by chapter 37, Jacob's sons were still killers. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. There's another mystery here about parenting. Jacob is raising the best man in the world. His name is Joseph. But Jacob is also raising other brothers who are willing to kill the best man in the world. Is he a success as a father or is he a failure? So Jacob sends him to check on the safety and the welfare of his brothers. But it says in verse... Um, um, 15 and 16 that uh, he discovers, well, he discovers in verse 17, some, a stranger says to him, they have moved from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. Well, that's another 20 miles or so. That's, that's, over, that's another 25 or 30 kilometers away, so he has to go further. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, if someone makes you go one mile, Go two. Go the second mile. I don't know if you have this expression in Russian, to go the second mile. And basically what it means is to go, is to do more than what is required of you. 
And in context in Matthew 5, Jesus seems to be suggesting that if an enemy requires you to do this, because he's talking about an evil person in the context, if an enemy requires you to do this, do more than you're required to do. Well, what if a friend asks you to do something? What if your earthly father asks you to do something? Should you only do the minimum or should you do more? What if your heavenly father asks you to do something? Should you only do the minimum or should you do more? So Joseph didn't stop in Shechem. He went all the way to Dothan. And it says in verse 17, Joseph went after his brothers and he found them. He found them at Dothan. Verse 18 says that when, he saw, when they saw him coming from a distance and he came closer to them, they, they decided to kill him. They plotted against him to put him to death. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. This is very famous in English in the older version. It says, behold, this dreamer cometh. It's, it's a famous expression. And then they say, let's kill him. We'll kill him, we'll throw him into the pits, and we'll say an animal killed him, a wild animal killed him. Then we'll see what will become of his dreams and his prophecies. They were determined to make sure that his prophecies never came true by personally killing him and by guaranteeing themselves that his dream was untrue. Now Reuben, who's the oldest, he hears this, verse 21, he rescues him out of their hands and says, let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, shed no blood, throw him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but do not lay hands on him. Now he, he didn't tell his brothers this, but his plan was to come back later and rescue him and send him back home. When Joseph arrived, in verse 22, they stripped the, the coat off of him, and then they took Joseph and threw it into the pit. Now, verse 25 says they sat down to eat a meal. Now, this shows how cruel they are. Can you imagine your brother is down in a pit thinking he's going to die, begging you not to do it, and you're having lunch? Doesn't bother you. You're able to have lunch. It also doesn't bother you that he sees you eating and drinking. He's come a long journey to make sure you're okay. He's in a pit with no water or nor, fo nor food, but you're having lunch while he's suffering in a pit. Can you imagine that kind of cruelty? These are the covenant people. These are the great-grandchildren of Abraham. And this is what they're doing to their brother. This is what they're doing to their brother who came to check on their welfare. Can you imagine what they would do to their enemies? Again, it's amazing that these things are told about the founders of the tribes, their great wickedness. These are not stories which are made up to make Israel proud of its nation. These stories would make Israel ashamed of its nation. These stories are not made up. These stories are true, and they are being faithfully reported. Um, it says in verse 25, they raised their eyes and they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites. These are the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's other son by Hagar. They're coming from Gilead. They're traders. They're on camels, and they're trading all kinds of things including myrrh, which was a gift later given to J Jesus. So Judah says, what good is it going to do for us to kill him and try to cover it up? You know, we can make money off this. If we kill him, we don't make any money. Let's don't kill him, let's sell him. Let's sell him as a slave to the Ishmaelites. After all, he is our brother, and it would be an unpleasant thing to do to kill him. Well, we see some progress with Judah. So when some Midianite traders passed by, they pulled him up and lifted Joseph out of the pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Then they brought, that's the way Joseph ended up coming into Egypt.